Hello and welcome back. I'm Joseph Hoffman, and in this lesson, we're going to circle back to a familiar favorite composer, Cornelius Gurlitt, to learn a piece from his Opus 82, number 65, which is entitled Etude in D minor. The word etude comes from the French verb étudier, which means to study. So a composer may call a piece etude if she or he thinks that a student may use or study that piece to help them advance their piano skills because the piece presents some kind of unique technical challenge. In Etude in D minor, the technical challenge is found in combining the damper pedal with fast but soft repeating chords in the right hand while the left hand plays a sweeping lyrical melody. Let's have a listen to Etude in D minor. Here's the score for Etude in D minor. Let's go through our new piece checklist. I always like to check the tempo indication. That will give us an idea for the mood of the piece. Here we see allegro, which is a familiar term, Italian term for fast. Non troppo, troppo, as the Italians would say. And that means not too much. So Gurlitt is saying he wants it fast, but not too fast. We've got to find just the right amount of fast. A composer may put a non troppo to make sure the performer doesn't get carried away and play it out of control fast. So that's good to know. We've got our treble and bass clefs. Let's figure out what key we're in. We, our clues are that we have one flat in the key signature, so that should narrow it down to F major or D minor. How do we tell? Well, our best clue is going to look at the first note or chord and the last note or chord. We start here with a D and F, and we end with what? Can you tell me the letter name for both of these notes? In the treble staff, we have a D, and what do we end on here in the bass staff? If you said low D, you're correct. Now, ending on a D, beginning with a D and F, which could be part of a D minor chord, these clues are telling us that we're going to be in the key of D minor. And what's our time signature? We'll be in 4-4 meter. Now, let's do some analysis. One of my favorite things to do before we learn a new piece. I'm gonna draw a box around certain chords and I'd like you in your own music to analyze what chords you see inside those boxes. If you see a line between two notes, that's an interval. I'd like you to figure out what is the interval. This interval goes off the page to here. So also find the interval from this low note to this note. And a couple of more. Pause the video in, in your own music Analyze the chords. You can just write in the chord symbol for each chord and write a number for the intervals and then press play. We'll look at the answers together. Okay, right here we have an A, D, F, A. Now we can see that the A is in there twice, so we can take away this bottom one and that reveals that it's a D minor chord, the symbol for which is capital D, little m for minor. And then what did you get for this chord? We have an A, an F, and a D. That's also a D minor 
chord. All right, now what interval did you get from here to here? This is base A going down to low A. What's a quick way to figure that out? Well, remember the bottom line of bass clef is ground G and then every ledger line is one skip down. We're three ledger lines down, so one, two, three. That puts us on low A. A to A is an octave or eighth. Octave, just another word for an eighth, right? And then from here to this D is the interval of a fourth. Now, what did you notice about these two chords? You should have caught they're the exact same chord that we had before, D minor, D minor. Now, if we didn't already realize by now, which of course we already figured out we're in the key of D minor, but look how much else is reinforcing that. Gurlitt is really driving home the fact that we're in D minor on this page. Now, what did you get for this interval? We have a C down to low C. Once again, you can use ground G, that bottom line, and then ledger line down, ledger line down. Every ledger line is a skip down. So that tells us C to C, that's an eighth or an octave. Okay, let's analyze page two now. I'll draw some more boxes for chord analysis and some lines for interval analysis. Okay, pause the video, analyze these chords, then press play, and we'll look at it together. All right, what do we have here? We've got C, F, A, C. Well, that C is duplicated up here, so we can just leave off this one, and that reveals we have an F major chord. And then what about here? C, A, F, that's also F major. And what chord did you get here? That's D minor. And then the same notes going back down, D minor again. And uh, what did you get for these intervals? Here's an eighth down and then a fourth up. Eighth down, fourth up. Now, I'd like you to do one more thing for me before we try to play this. Starting here on beat four in measure 13, I'd like you to look at these notes up till here and tell me if you notice a pattern. What pattern do you see? We have three notes stepping up, A, B flat, C. Don't forget, every time you have a B, because of the key signature, it's automatically flat. So we have three notes stepping up, and what happens here? Three notes stepping up, three notes stepping up. But every time we're starting on a step below where we started before. This one starts on A, this one starts on G, this one starts on F. A pattern like that in music is called a sequence. The same pattern which repeats one step below each time, or it can also repeat one step up each time. It's a great musical device that composers use. Now that we've analyzed this, I'd like you to pause the video and figure out the left hand part for the entire piece. Go all the way back to the beginning and see if you can learn on your own the notes for the left hand part. Be very careful of the fingerings, be careful of the notes. The reason we took the time to analyze these chords is to help you learn it more quickly and more efficiently. So instead of thinking of a whole bunch of random notes, you're thinking, oh, it's just an F major arpeggio. So think about the chords, think about the intervals as you play, and that will help you learn it. So pause to learn the left hand part on your own, and then press play and we'll look at it together. Let's take a look at the first four notes of the left hand part. We start here on finger five, and we have this arpeggio up through the D minor chord. Now I want you to notice how my hand does this. I want you to notice that I don't do this. 
In other words, don't stretch out your fingers to touch all four notes at the same time. There's no need to do that. That just creates tension where you don't need it. If we were playing a four note chord with all four at the same time, then we would need to do that. But where we play just one at a time, you wanna think of letting the fingers stretch to their next key and then gather. Stretch and then gather. If I were doing that in slow motion. And so your fingers always are trying to stay in the most neutral, relaxed position possible. You're not, you know, once you're done playing this note, you don't need to keep your pinky down there, right? Just let all of your fingers follow along. Here we cross over to finger two and then come back down. And you'll notice there are no fingerings marked on beats two and three in measure three. And that's because you can use pretty much whatever feels natural. It could be one, three, five, could be one, two, four. That's what feels the most natural to me. The reason it doesn't really matter that much is because here you'll see the end of the phrase mark and you have to pick up your hand to come down to these next three notes. If you don't pick up your hand, you're gonna to have to do some kind of crazy gymnastics to get finger three down there. And there's no need to do that. Because it's the end of a phrase, you can just pick up your hand. And that actually creates a little breath in between the two phrases. By a breath, I mean when your fingers lift off the keys, it creates a really brief moment of silence, which is actually good to have that little lift between those two phrases. Later on, we'll be adding damper pedal, which will smooth that out anyway. Lift the hand, we move down, come down an octave, and then up the fourth. Now, I want you to play from measure one to that first note of measure five, and I want you to think about gathering your fingers, keeping your hand in a really neutral shape, lift the hand, you, play, you reach down, then let your fingers gather again, and you finish the phrase. Pause the video to work on that technique, and then press play to go on. Okay, then going on from measure five, we have the same phrase again, but we're crescendoing now up to mezzo forte. And now we're up to forte through the F major triad. And notice it gets piano here. Isn't that a cool moment? I love that part. Okay, let's pause there. And I'd like you to practice from measure nine here, this forte part. And then suddenly get quiet there. Make sure you're following those dynamics. Okay, and let's stop there on beat three of measure 13. Pause to practice that on your own, then press play to go on. Okay, and then starting here on beat four of measure 13, we've got our sequence. And then decrescendoing, now piano. Getting softer and softer to a pianissimo, and then you're done. At the end of a piece, always remember to float your wrist up in a beautiful floating motion. Notice in the score in measure 18, this new symbol, Rallentondo. R-A-L-L -L dot stands for the Italian word Rallentondo, which means about the same thing as ritardando. It means to gradually slow down. But composers tend to use rallentando, especially when they want this kind of dying away feeling. The composer could have used ritardando there, but rallentando again implies this, ah, oh, the piece is just kind of unwinding and coming to stop. Now again, as you're learning a piece, if you're paying really close attention to the fingerings, 
the dynamics, all those little details will help you learn it properly so when you put it together with the other hand, you've already got a good foundation and you know where your fingers are supposed to go. So take the time to learn the correct fingerings, the correct notes, and rhythms, the dynamics from the start. And that will help you as you go forward and add the right hand in our next lesson. Great work analyzing and learning to play the left hand part of Etude in D minor by Cornelius Gurlitt. Happy practicing and see you at our next lesson. We will now hear Etude in D minor by Cornelius Gurlitt, Opus 82, number 65 with Princess as conductor, leading the Sharp Sisters and <coughs> Moo Cow. Boom, boom, boom.